It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Marshall Gans, who is the very epitome of an engaged scholar. Marshall Gans grew up in Bak Bakersfield, California, where his father... <laughs> where his father was a rabbi and his mother a teacher. He entered Harvard College in the fall of 1960s, just as the civil rights era was heating up. He left a year before graduating to volunteer with the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project and became an organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. In the fall of 1965, he joined Cesar Chavez in his efforts to unionize California farm workers. and worked with the Uni United Farm Workers for 16 years. During the 1980s, he worked for grassroots, with grassroots groups to develop new organizing programs and design um, innovative voter mobilization strategies for local, state, and national electoral campaigns. In 1991, in order to deepen his intellectual understanding of his work, work he returned to Harvard after a 28-year leave of absence <laughs> and completed his undergraduate degree in history and government. He was also then awarded an MPA by the Kennedy School in 1993, and he completed his PhD in sociology in the year 2000. Today, he is a senior lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, where he teaches, researches, and writes on leadership, organization, and strategy in social movements, civic associations, and politics. His newest book, Why David Sometimes Wins, Leadership Organization and Strategy in the California Farm Worker Movement, was published in 2009 and earned the Michael J. Harrington Book Award from the American Political Science Association. Please join me in welcoming Marshall Gans. Good morning. How you can do better than that? Good morning. How are you doing? All right. Well, first of all, I just want to say congratulations um, to you, the students, to your families, and to your teachers. Well done. Primero que nada, felicidades a ustedes, los estudiantes, a sus familias, a sus maestros. Bien hecho. To the students, clearly it's a day to honor your achievements, but also a day to honor the sacrifice, hard work, and inspiration of all those without whom many of you, many of us, would not be here. A los estudiantes, claro, es un día de honrar sus éxitos, pero también es un día de honrar los sacrificios, el trabajo y la fe de parte de otros sin que muchos no estarían, no estaríamos aquí tampoco. Por eso les invito un aplauso fuerte para todos. I invite you an applause for, for everyone. Although this day celebrates a completion, the fact it's called a commencement real, reveals it's really about the crossing of a threshold a beginning as well as an end, a new chapter, a new mission, or in word, real life. But what I'd like to talk to you, that's what I'd like to talk to you about, um, not life in general, that would take more than 15 minutes, but about leadership in particular, in particular the kind of leadership that you may have the opportunity to exercise and to mm -hmm. offer, leadership in organizing, leadership in action, leadership in change. But I want to be clear what I mean by leadership. The term is used for so many things. For me, it's best summed up in three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who, when asked, how am I to understand what I am to do in the world, responded with three questions. Ask yourself first, he said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Now, this isn't a selfish question, but it's a self-regarding question. If I presume to lead, then I need to know what I'm about. What do I value? 
What do I bring? What's in it for me? To be for myself is to honor the sources of my own worth, respecting my limitations and building on my strengths. But second, he said to ask yourself, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what is to recognize that we exist in the world in relationship with others. And our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably bound up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And finally, he said, ask yourself, if not now, when? That didn't mean, that's not advice to jump into oncoming traffic. What it does mean is that, we, that because we can never know the future, action always entails risk and therefore requires courage but that we can rarely learn how to do what we need to do well enough to achieve it without beginning to do it. In other words, understanding flows from action. It does not precede it. It's like learning to ride a bicycle. You learn to ride a bicycle by studying bicyclology? I don't think so. <laughs> Getting on the bike, accepting the falls, and finding the courage to keep falling because it's the only way you know you can learn to keep your balance. That's what it's all about. So understanding grows out of action. So for me, leadership is about the interaction of all these three, self, other, and action. The fact that there's questions, too, is very important because it's an invitation to understand leadership as not being about having all the right answers, but rather having the right questions. It makes sense. Do we need leadership when, when everything's working fine? When everything's going great? When do people say, where's the leadership? Isn't it when things break down, there's new challenges, we don't know what to do? It turns out, in fact, the domain of leadership is not the known, but the unknown. Not the certain, but the uncertain. Not control, but adaptation. In a word, about learning, learning, and learning. It is about learning much more than knowing. So the definition that I've come to use for leadership is this. It's about accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. That doesn't sound exactly like a diva theory of leadership, does it? It's not. Doesn't even sound like an entrepreneurial theory of leadership where there's one person with a brilliant idea and gets everybody else to fall into line. It's a notion of leadership as engaging with others around the work of developing shared purpose and mobilizing the capacity to achieve those purposes. That's the understanding of leadership I want to share with you. Now, so first question, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? I first asked myself these questions in June of 1964 when I'd finished my third year at Harvard and volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project. The theory of the Summer Project was that since the law did not protect black people trying to organize in Mississippi, they would be jailed, beaten, or worse, it might protect white people from the North coming to organize in Mississippi. So why not try to bring the law to Mississippi by bringing people the law might cover to Mississippi? That was the strategy. Some 300 of us were gathered for training at a college in southern Ohio, getting ready to go to Mississippi the next morning. When we got word that three of our party, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, had disappeared. They'd been dispatched a week earlier and the day before sent to investigate the burning of a black church in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and had not been heard from since. So Bob Moses, appropriately named, a very soft-spoken guy, our lead organizer, called us together in an auditorium much like this one, about 300 of us. And Bob's a soft-spoken guy. He went up on the stage alone. He told us our three brothers have not been heard from, we don't know what happened, but we do know what happened. They're gone. I would like to tell all of you, go home. You're not needed. It'll be okay. There's no shame, but I can't. I have to ask you to go. We need you to go. And then there was silence. 
I sank into my seat like everybody else in the room, asking myself, what in the hell had I gotten into? This was one of those minutes that seemed like an hour. Was this for real? What was I doing there? My father was a rabbi, and we had lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War, where he served as a chaplain in the American army. Most of his work was with Holocaust survivors, people I met in our home whose lives had been shattered by that horror. But my parents inter in interpreted the Holocaust to me as being not simply about anti-Semitism, but about racism, and that racism kills. Not a complicated political or ideological question, racism kills. We were going to Mississippi to fight the institutionalized racism that has been central to our country's history since its founding. As a rabbi's son, I had to go to all the service religious events. I don't know if there's any PKs here, like preacher's kids, I don't know. Uh, you have to go to everything. You're also supposed to be perfect, which is a different issue. <laughs> but, but the one I really liked was the Passover Seder, the celebration with food of the story of the Exodus, the journey of a people, my people, from slavery to freedom. And at one point they turn to the children and they say, you were slaves in Egypt. And I say, wait a second, I've never been a slave. I've never been to Egypt. And eventually came to understand that what that meant was that this story is not the property of one place, one time, or even one people, but is told generation after generation. And you had to figure out where you were in it. Were you with those guys in the chariots with those horses chasing those people? Or were you with those people trying to find the land of promise? The civil rights movement literally told the same story in the same language about the same promise. And as I looked around the room, my peers, 18, 19, 20 years old, all young people, come of age, with a critical eye on the world we found and almost of necessity hopeful hearts. And there we were, sitting in silence, asking ourselves, what have we gotten into? Did we really care that much? At that point, a young African-American woman, a SNCC organizer, Jean Wheeler, stood up in the back and she began to sing. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say that freedom is a constant struggle they say that freedom's a constant struggle. Oh, Lord, we struggled so long, we must be free. And then they say that freedom is a constant dying. We've died too long. We must be free. And as she began to find her way out of the room, one by one, each person got up, fell in behind her, marched out of the room, and the next day, we all went to Mississippi. Well, that moment changed my life. My career went through many changes, but not my calling. And what was that calling? Let me go to Hillel's second question. If I am for myself alone, what am I? In Mississippi, I began to learn the power of relationships, where, with all due respect to Harvard, my real political education began. On any measure of well-being, housing, healthcare, education, jobs, whites were here and blacks were here. But we also learned the difference between charity and justice. Bringing a few books or medical supplies, a charitable response was a kind thing, but it wasn't going to change anything. Justice isn't satisfied observing a problem, but demands to know why there is a problem. And that's when everybody gets nervous. You quickly learn that if some people are losing, others are benefiting, often at the expense of those that are losing. So if you want to take that one on, you find yourself in the middle of a fight because the problem is not one of information or education or technology. The problem is quite simply one of power. It's a word we don't hear that much these days. Blacks at the time in the South had no political rights, couldn't vote. Economically, agricultural workers were excluded from all the labor laws that were passed in the 1930s. And I'd never had the experience of going up to someone twice my age who would stand up, offer me his chair, not look me in the eye, introduce himself with his first name uh, because he was black and I was white. And that went on thousands of times a day across the South between blacks and whites. So put together the political and the economic and the cultural powerlessness and you begin to get the picture. So where do you go to get some power? How do you fix a power problem? Well, some people said you go to where the power is. And in those days, we thought it was Washington, D.C. And so 
People went to Washington, D.C. Hi, could we have a little bit of your power to fix this problem down here? Well, you can imagine how that went. Um, we need more data. We need more research. Um, Testify before our committee. Well, these things take time. 300 years? Well, these things take time. So what we quickly learned was that unless the people with the problem could also become authors of the solution to the problem, it would never be solved. It would never be solved. But that's a problem. But, that, but, but there's a dilemma there because they don't have any power. So what we learned was there's a difference between resources and power. And we learned that while many communities lack power, they're not entirely lacking in resources. And the challenge of an organized, the leadership challenge, was to figure out how to enable a community to turn its resources into the power that it needed to create the change that it wanted. Now that sounds pretty abstract. So let me get pretty concrete. Let me get very concrete. This is the lesson we learned from the Montgomery bus boycott. You know the Montgomery bus boycott? Everybody heard of Rosa Parks? The lady who one day got tired, and so no. Secretary of the NAACP chapter in Montgomery, trained at the Highlander School in organizing. This was all a strategy. See, the way the buses worked in Montgomery in 1955 was that there were uh, uh, whites in the front, blacks in the back, armed deputized bus driver and a no man's land in between. And if you were a black person, you walked, you, first you went to the armed deputized bus driver, you gave him your money. Then you walked past the rows of white people, you got to the, the rows where you could sit. But if a white person wanted that seat, then you had to get up and give it to him. Going to work, coming home from work twice a day, think about what that does to your sense of dignity. Twice a day. Now, the year before the Supreme Court said that segregation was unconstitutional in schools. We're still working on that one. But the people in Montgomery, the people in Montgomery got a spark of hope from that and said, well, maybe, you know, in the schools, maybe we can do the same thing with the buses. Maybe we can file a lawsuit and do the same thing. And so they planned to file a lawsuit. They needed a plaintiff. They picked a very respectable person, Rosa Parks, to be the one who would be arrested, and she was arrested. But then Joanne Robinson, the leader of the Women's Committee at the, at the Black College, said, we can't let Rosa go to jail by herself. We've got to get the community, show some solidarity. So she went to Dr. King, they went to Dr. King and the others and said, look, let's get everybody to stay off the buses for one day. We think we can do that. So they leafleted the churches. That following Monday morning, when the buses began to roll, there's a great account of Dr. King up early looking to see who was on the buses and not a single black face was on any of those buses. And that community began to look at itself differently from that point on. Look what we did. Look what we accomplished. And they decided to turn one day into what became one year. Because what they discovered was they could, look, they could find power not by looking up, but by looking down. And when you look down, what do you see? What does everybody see when you look down? You see your feet. And if they used, and it turned out everybody in that community had feet. And if you used your feet, Instead of using those feet to get on the bus and give the bus company your bus fare, use those feet to walk to work, and it wasn't just one person, but it was everybody, it turned out the bus company was dependent on the community more than the community on the bus company. It took a year, but in a year they won, and that is how you turn resources into power. And at the end of all that, they not only got these segregated buses, but they had built a powerful community and they had developed the leadership that would then spark a movement throughout this country. What sparked the movement was not the lawsuit, it was a discovery that ordinary people had the capacity to create change if they acted together with skill and determination and purpose. And that takes skilled leadership. That takes skilled leadership. Dr. King learned in the Baptist church. Rosa Parks was trained at Highlander School. E.D. Nixon, another of the leaders, was trained on the Sleeping Car Porters Union, the first major black union in the United States. They learned the tools of organizing and of leadership. So that um, is where I got hooked. The idea of recruiting, de developing, training leadership, building community around that leadership, and enabling communities to turn their resources into a source of power Leadership not providing services to grateful clients. Leadership's not marketing products to consumers. But leadership as 
bringing members of a community together to become a constituency, which from the Latin constare means to stand together. In other words, enabling a community to master the tools needed to come together, decide together, stand together, and act together. I left Mississippi in the summer of 1965, but instead of going back to school, I'm afraid I wrote them a rather arrogant letter. How can I come back and study history when we're busy making history? <laughs> but it was true. I returned home here to Bakersfield, where Cesar Chavez had just started a grape strike 30 miles from, from where I grew up. Now, I grew up in the middle of the farm worker community, but I'd never seen it. I had to go to Mississippi to get educated about race, power, and politics in America and get what we called Mississippi eyes to come back home and see, oh, here was another community of people of color, also without political rights, also without, without the economic protections of other workers. And guess what? California has its own rich history of racial discrimination and segregation going back not only to the native peoples, but to the Chinese at the turn of the century. And as late as the 1950s, people were desegregating movie theaters in LA that had whites downstairs and Mexicans upstairs. It turns out Mississippi was not an exception to America. It was an example of the America we needed to change. So, <clears throat> So I began working with Caesar for the next 16 years, up until 1981, and that was a place where I learned the craft of organizing because we had to work in so many different ethnic communities, the polyglot of California agriculture, people brought from this country, from that country, often to undermine the efforts of those already here to organize. But it meant it was a cultural mosaic in which we had to learn to work. The diverse kinds of organizing, community organizing, political organizing. My first campaign was Bobby Kennedy in 1968. We did the Get Out the Boat in East LA, where non-citizens came to East Los Angeles to mobilize the votes of citizens in that primary election and won it for Senator Kennedy, even though he was taken from us later that night. I worked with the farm workers until 1981, did another 10 years of union issue and electoral work, mostly here in California. And then I got invited to my 25th reunion at Harvard. Now, that was really strange. I mean, I never graduated. <laughs> I mean, I was a dropout, you know? I, now, now, they might make an exception for another dropout who developed a moderately successful software company up in Seattle. <laughs> but that wasn't my story. But I went, and it was like running into a 20-year-old version of me who was still there. So 20-year-old me says, how's it going? And I say, I don't know, I'm feeling stuck. I'm feeling, I've been doing this stuff for all these years, I gotta find a way to go deeper, to go broader. So 20-year-old me said, why don't you come back and finish that senior year, you never do. I said, I don't know, I don't know, my brain may not work, you know? These synapses get tired, but thanks to some of the encouragement of some of my old roommates, I found the courage to see one of the deans the last day. He turned out to be an Episcopal priest. We talked for three hours. We discussed the fact that tuition had changed a little bit in the intervening years. <laughs> but we figured it out. So in 1991, I went back, wrote a senior thesis in history and government for which Margaret Weir was my advisor. Where are you, Margaret? Yes. And, and graduated class of 64-92. And my 81-year-old mother got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate. So, but I got the bug, so went on to the Kennedy School for an MPA and the Sociology Department for a PhD, where I also had the privilege of studying with Marion and with Irene, uh, who were in, uh, we were all in the, same, in the same cohort there together. I was on the elder end of that cohort, uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> While working on my PhD, I was asked to design a course on organizing at the Kennedy School. And that turned out to be a great gift to me because it was a place to integrate my life experience, my practice, with the research and social science that I was learning in a conversation with a rising generation. I came to think of going to class twice a week. Wow, you get to have a conversation with the future twice a week. How about that? And so my teaching became central to my learning. And the pedagogy that emerged from that teaching, probably one of the ma major contributions that I've been able to make. 
helping people learn how to master these skills, how to build these relationships, how to tell the stories, how to design the strategy, how to design the structures, how to take action, so as to turn the values that they aspire to and the needs that they confront into reality. I've been on the faculty full time at the Kennedy School t since 2000. And the truth is, though, I found my way back into the world of practice through my students. The Dean Campaign, 2003. Major projects with the Sierra Club. The Obama Campaign of 2007. Working with the Dreamers. Working with PowerShift. And now, through a distance learning class I've taught for the last five years with young people from Tokyo, Amman, Belgrade, Nairobi, all working in different ways to turn the resources they have into the power they need to create the world they want. So, so that's my story, and I'm almost done here. So that's my story of a lifetime in dialogue with Hillel's three questions of self, of us, and of now. Walter Brueggemann, a Protestant theologian, wrote a book called The Prophetic Imagination, and he says that transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two kinds of experience. One, criticality, he calls criticality, by which he means the experience of the world's hurt, of its limitations, of its pain. But the other, he says, is hope. And I don't think he means the kind of optimism that blinds us to the real challenges of life. I don't think he's talking about la-di-da, some people call hokey hope. I think he means understanding what the 12th century philosopher Maimonides defined hope as being belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. Now let me translate. What he's saying is that to be a realist is to recognize that the world is not only a place of probability with all due respect to social science. It is always probable that Goliath will win. He's bigger, he's stronger. But sometimes David does. It was improbable we would ever elect a black man president of the United States during my lifetime, but we did in 2000. In 2007, look around, nobody thought it could happen, but it happened. The point of hope is belief in the possible. The preciousness of what is possible the possibilities that life has to offer. And that's the point. Without the experience of pain, what motive do we have to try to fix the world? And let me just ask, how many people in this room have had their experiences of loss or pain? Raise your hand. Hurt, loss, pain. But staying there goes only to despair. We've also had experiences of hope in our own lives. And let me ask you that too. How many people of here have had an experience of hope? If you hadn't, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here trying to change the sources that cause the pain. And that's the point. That's where the action is. It's at the interaction of the challenge and the hope that the promise of transformational vision and change comes. And young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find, thank the Lord, and almost of necessity, hopeful hearts. And that's why there's such a deep connection between generational change and social change. So it was for my generation, and so I believe it is for yours. The challenges are different. Our aspirations may be different. The technology certainly is different. But the values that are at stake, the needs that are crying out, and the extraordinary opportunity to act on those needs are as great as ever, if not greater. And that's the work of leadership. I want to conclude with a song, and I'm not going to sing it. In the fourth grade, I was told, please mild the words, and that was sort of the end of... <laughs> not all teachers, you know, anyway. But I, I want to explain, uh, this was a song that Judy, Judy Collins uh, recorded in the 60s about the civil rights movement. I want to say one thing, though. The civil rights movement never called itself the civil rights movement. It called itself the freedom movement. Because freedom is a much bigger idea. It's a much bigger thing than civil rights, than legal protections. Freedom is about living your life with dignity, living with others for whom you care and who care for you. It's about living in a world in which there is promise and hope. That's what freedom is about. So hear the word that way. And here's the song. Freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing, doesn't fall down like the summer rain. 
Freedom, freedom is a hard one thing. You have to work for it, fight for it, day and night for it, and every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children, brother. Pass it on to your children, sister. They have to work for it. They have to fight for it, day and night for it. And every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children. Pass it on. Thank you for the opportunity to pass some of it on. And good luck. <laughs>